Okay. I think it's it's time again. So we're going to start with a different topic this time. We're done with computation and memory. Were those lectures interesting? Do people like it? Yes. <laughs> You're very interested. So if you have any thoughts, uh, let's, let's, let's have a discussion on processing in memory after the end of the simulation lecture. I wanted to sneak in the simulation lecture before we start talking about memory latency. Because I think what we, uh, you, implicitly we talked a lot about simulation without really talking about the benefits of it uh, or the trade-offs uh, of it. And I wanted to focus on those trade-offs a little bit uh, in this lecture. And you're building simulators. In your first lab, you built a simulator, hopefully. It's done, right? If it's not done, keep working on it. I would like you to learn how things are done. Uh, we can be flexible with the deadlines, as you know, for the, for the labs. <laughs> okay? My, my main motivation in this course is for you to learn. Don't worry about the grades. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's talk about simulation. Uh, I presented a lot of results to you so far in this course, and a lot of them were actually based on simulation. Not everything, of course, right? Something like Rohammer was not based on simulation. And I actually mentioned that it's very hard to simulate some of these effects. But some effects we can simulate, especially if we know what we're doing. And simulation is a very, very important tool as an architect. If, because you're building something for the future, how do you evaluate that? It answers the key question of how will this thing behave after I produce it. But you want to do this without producing that thing, right? Because if you had to produce it, then you've already gone through all of the pain and all of the cost. But you want to make a trade-off. You want to understand whether you should really go with design choice X, Y, Z and build a system. And that's why you, we want to simulate. And simulation is clearly done in many, many fields, right? Climate is one example. People try to simulate the climate so that they want to understand what's going to happen to the world 10 years from now. 100 years from now or a day from now, right? There are different levels of predictability that you want as well from simulation, and that's a, another kind of simulation. And clearly, uh, you make trade-offs whenever you do that simulation, and all of that simulation relies on computers, by the way. The climate simulation, if you really want to get accurate, you really want very high-performance computing systems. And of course, while you're building those high-performance computing systems, you don't want to expend a lot of energy as well. You don't want to go into this vicious cycle. You want to understand what's going to happen to the world 50 years later. And while you're doing that, you're destroying the world by consuming a lot of energy with the systems. That's not a good thing, right? And all of the last three lectures was really about that, right? In a sense, how do we build much more efficient systems so that we don't, we're much more sustainable and energy efficient? Okay, so this particular uh, lecture will focus on simulation, especially in memory. But I will start more general uh, simulation in computer architecture, so simulating systems. And I also, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll broaden up a little bit. I, this is really about how do, how do we evaluate new ideas uh, for new architectures? Uh, should we include an idea uh, in an architecture that we design? Basically, this is, what, this is the question that we want to answer in the end. We have an idea or we have a system design in mind. Uh, how do we assess that will improve a target metric X or to multiple target metrics X, Y, Z, T? And today, we have many, many target metrics, as you know. It's... it's Performance, energy, reliability, security, cost, all of those we want to check. And a lot of the focus of this lecture will be on performance and energy, but really it's, a simulation can help with all of these different target metrics. And we, we clearly have a variety of uh, methods available to us as scientists or engineers. So I, I'm going to list some of these methods, and if you, have some, some, if you think there's something missing, let me know. One of the things could be theoretical proof, right? Uh, clearly, you, want, you, want, you may want to be able to prove a property about a system. The performance of the system will be X. It turns out this is very, very difficult to do in compu uh, designing computing architectures, right? Because you, the system you're building, it's not there yet. You don't even understand the interactions it has. And on top of that, there will be some workload that's going to execute on the system. And you, don't, you may not even know what's going to execute over there. Even if you assume that you know what's going to execute, the workload's behavior may be dependent on the input that's supplied to the system, and that input you may not be able to predict, right? So theoretical proof, while it's a very worthy goal, it's very hard to do in designing real systems uh, today. As a result, it's not very heavily used. That said, under certain conditions, if you make certain assumptions 
about the workload. If you make certain assumptions about the system usage, you can potentially prove properties, right? The performance will not be less than X, for example, right? But that requires a lot of assumption. And it turns out, in many cases, it's very hard to ensure that those assumptions will remain correct. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. But this is, don't forget that this could be a potential evaluation method. I mean, you could do it. I think this is very good. It just turns out that it's not very easy to do in, what, uh, in, in computer uh, architecture. The next one is analytical modeling and estimation. This is also important. Basically, if, uh, this, this is not simulation. Clearly, if you can somehow analytically model a system, build any, uh, create, create an equation, for example, that says, uh, that, for example, predicts the performance by plugging on some parameters to the equation, that could be good. That could be relatively fast also. Right? For example, people have tried to build analytical models of main memory uh, or processors, and basically they take some features. Uh, it could be a linear model. A very simple model could be a linear model. Right? You create a linear regression model that has some parameters, and uh, uh, it could be, for example, a, the performance of the system is equal to AX plus BY plus CZ plus uh, D, I guess, Q, let's say. <laughs> and then uh, you have some... Uh, uh, coefficients a, b, c, d, and uh, x, y, z, q are really the parameters. And you somehow somehow build this model. You could build this with machine learning. Clearly, it's a very simple linear regression model. Uh, and you figure out those coefficients, and then you estimate x, y, z, q based on the workload, for example. And uh, based on your workload. Uh, you, you, you plug in those parameters uh, to the model, and uh, the model itself gives you the performance that you expect. Right? And this could be relatively accurate, assuming that you built the model accurately, uh, and it's representative right, of the workload and the system. Right? And I think this is also good uh, to strive for, except it turns out this is also not very easy <laughs> to do in general, although it's easier than theoretical proof in uh, building systems. Does that make sense? And sometimes when you want to build a model, you actually want to do simulation first to really understand what parameters you should look at, what should your coefficients, should, uh, what should your coefficients be uh, in the system. And you really want to analyze the systems, existing systems as well. Okay, so don't forget that this is also another tool. And when you can actually use this, this is very fast because you just plug in some numbers. Of course, you need to be able to get the numbers fast, uh, the parameters fast, and the evaluation of the parameters should also be fast. For example, you could imagine uh, uh, building a neural network-based uh, analytical model, right? The neural network could be your analytical model, and then you plug in some parameters, and that gives you potential estimation. I don't know how to do that. I just made it up. But it's potentially possible to do things like that going forward. And that's not simulation, really. You learn something. You build a model out of what you've learned, and you plug in inputs so that you understand, uh, you, 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 get, uh, you get some indication of uh, what the outputs should be. And outputs could be, again, performance, energy, et cetera, of the system. Okay, I think there's, there should be more work in this area uh, going forward also. In the early days, uh, when people were actually building systems, people actually built a lot of analytical models for caches, for example. Uh, when, you, when you design a cache, you were simulating a cache in your first lab, for example. People did that, but people also tried to uh, uh, build analytical models for caches, and uh, they did a good job. But usually analytical models uh, fail when your workload is not very predictable, when your workload is very irregular, for example, uh, and it doesn't fit the model you built, then the estimates that you get out of the analytical model are usually very off. For example, the cache models, for, for them to be effective, uh, usually they, they assume LRU-like behavior, assuming your replacement policy is least recently used. Now, if your behavior is not least recently used, like, meaning that you're not going to touch recently used items relatively frequently, those models give you estimates that are relatively off. And I think this is expected, right? Whenever you learn a model or construct a model, your highest accuracy is uh, when the assumptions that you make when you're constructing the model are similar to the assumptions uh, of the workload and the system in operation. Okay. So the next one is simulation, uh, and this is what we're going to really focus on. And simulation also has very de varying degrees of abstraction and accuracy, and we will talk about that. And hopefully you know what simulation is. You're doing it for your labs, for all your labs, actually. 
But there, this, is not, this is not all. Uh, remember, the question is, how do you assess an idea will improve a target metric X? You can also prototype with a real system, right? You can also build the idea on an FPGA. Not necessarily the system that you are going to you are envisioning in the field, but you build a system on a reconfigurable fabric, like an FPGA, for example, you prototype it, and you try to guess what kind of improvement you would get in the target metric X based on that prototype. This is different from simulation. Now, you're not doing simulation of the system, you're really building the system, except not in the same substrate, or not exactly the same way you're going to build in real, uh, uh, in real life, let's say. And this could give you indication, right? Uh, this is prototyping. Now, there's a difference here. People sometimes use FPGAs to do simulation, especially accelerate simulation. That's really simulation. Simulation and prototyping are two different things. Prototyping is really, uh, you build the same system that you want, except on a different substrate. Simulation is, you actually are simulating the system that you want to build, except you're accelerating that simulation with an FPGA, for example, by, uh, by putting part of your simulator in reconfigurable fabric so that it ex ex executes faster. These are two different things. That makes sense, right? Okay. Okay, so simulation can be done clearly uh, in software, but it could also be accelerated in hardware using FPGAs. And people are actually increasingly doing that uh, in systems because they figure out that if you want to uh, build fast simulators that are also accurate, you really want to accelerate those simulators. Okay, well, this is not... Uh, that's not all of it, actually. There's one, uh, one other potential way of uh, figuring out whether a target metric X will be improved if you actually implement that idea, and that's really real implementation, right? And we already talked about that. Uh, let's say you want to build the best uh, new prefetcher idea that you have. You go and build it in a real system as it's going to be built, and you see whether it will improve target metric X, except this is very costly, clearly, right? Because then you're really building the system. So ideally, what we really want to do is to understand, uh, basically get an answer to this question without really building the system while using one of these over here with little effort, as little effort as possible, while, of course, getting a very good indication of uh, how much the idea will improve a target metric X. Right? Ideally, we would like to really get the accuracy of a real implementation without the effort of a real implementation. So you want to really maximize your return on investment, if you will. Of course, if any of your methods provides wrong results, meaning it, it gives you uh, a very high error in terms of accuracy, then, uh, then you, you may make the wrong decisions, clearly. Okay, so there's clearly a difficulty in architectural evaluation. So let me, let's focus on this a little bit more. Uh, by the way, does anybody have anything else to add over here? I think this is a relatively comprehensive list, but if you have another method that doesn't fall into these categories, let me know. Okay. So there's clearly difficulty in architectural evaluation. We talked about some of that. Uh, and one of the big difficulties is the answer for that question, how much will an idea improve a, a, a target metrics X, is usually workload dependent. So think caching, for example. Caching clearly is beneficial for workloads that fit in the cache, let's say, or that reference the same line over and over, that have high uh, temporal and spatial locality. Pipelining, even pipelining. If you don't have a lot of data dependencies, pipelining is great, actually. Once you start having a lot of data dependencies or branch uh, control flow dependencies, then pipelining may not work very well. And any idea we talked about, like Raider, for example, uh, memory scheduling ideas, you can add more of these things. And uh, the benefit of Raider is very much workload dependent, for example. The benefit that you get when the workload is accessing memory versus not accessing memory is different. And workloads also change. So workloads, uh, the, it's not only that the answer is just workload dependent, workloads also change over time. What you're doing today to, your, to do your evaluation, you may assume some workloads, but 10 years down the road, they may be completely different. And 10 years is not a long time. I've been using this computer for five years. And workloads have changed. And uh, on top of this, system has many design choices and parameters. Clearly, we're building complex systems. Uh, and the architect really needs to decide many ideas and many parameters for a design. Even if you're focusing on a simple part of the system, uh, that, sy that part of the system may have interactions with other parts, for example. You may increase the cache size, but you may, get a lot of, you may not get a lot of benefit because for some reason the out-of-order execution engine or your prefetcher may be already working well. Right? So you really need to consider those interactions in the system, and they, they make it hard to evaluate the systems. 
And clearly, it's not easy to evaluate all possible combinations if you're going to change a lot of parts of the system. Even in a cache, they have a lot of combinations. And on top of the system parameters may change over time, especially if you're building reconfigurable systems, right? This is also important. So clearly, if you want to evaluate all of these things, uh, you need to somehow understand how your system behaves. And simulation is a good tool for at least trying to reason about things. Because you can simulate the workload, for example, right? You may not be able to predict exactly what this is, but if you can also abstract the workloads and you can, in your simulator, you can say, if I change the workload this way and, or this way or this way, then my system will be this much, per, uh, will provide this much performance, this much performance, this much efficiency, right? You can actually stretch the boundaries of workloads by actually simulating them. And clearly, simulation enables you to explore this, this design space. But as we will see, this design space is so huge that we still need to somehow prune the design space. And people have actually explored machine learning methods to somehow prune the design space to figure out what, what parts of the system uh, space, what parts of the design space is really good to uh, focus on and improve. But we're not going to talk about that. That's, there's, this is actually a research area in terms of methodology of how to improve uh, simulation. Okay, so let's talk about simulation a bit more. Any questions so far? Hopefully this is not a boring topic. I think it's a very fascinating topic, actually. It's, it should be really taught in many other classes that, that use simulation as well. Okay, I, I think of simulation as a field of dreams, right? Because as, as architects, I think we're, we're actually in part... Uh, Actually, this is the best part of architecture, perhaps, because you can dream. You're, in, you're really, in part, a dreamer, a creator. You're, you want to create something, but you want to understand what you really want to create. And as a result, we resort to simulation, and it's our key tool. Uh, well, you can resort to other things also, but simulation is a key tool because you can really simulate uh, what the, how the system could behave. And it allows the evaluation and understanding of non-existent systems. That's, re that's the real benefit. We will see some other benefits in a little bit. You can improve an existing system if you actually simulate it really well and tweak it a little bit. Even that's a non-existent system. But uh, simulation has other benefits as well. You can try to figure out the bugs in your system, for example, if you have a very good simulator that mimics the behavior of your system. But this is the big benefit. Uh, and it enables, clearly, the exploration of many dreams. You can explore many different ideas. Uh, whatever you can think of, you can simulate, actually. If you cannot simulate, then... Maybe you're not thinking about simulation creatively. <laughs> you will think about that also, perhaps. <laughs> I believe this, actually. You, you, can, you can simulate any dream. But it also provides a reality check of the dreams because you really want to understand how much a particular dream or idea will improve performance or whatever metric you're targeting. And clearly, it helps you decide which dream is better, right? Whether you want to improve your cache or have a better prefetcher. That's a very simple comparison. But you can do many of these comparisons at the same time. But also, unfortunately, it also enables the ability to fool yourself with false dreams. Right? So you've got to be very careful when you're doing this. Because if you haven't really built your simulator to be accurate enough, the simulator may give you a wrong answer in the end. Right? It may say, OK, do caching, whereas prefetching, a much better prefetcher idea that you had, is really the right uh, thing to do. Why? Because your simulator has too much inaccuracy. It's not able to distinguish uh, between the ideas accurately. So this is very important to keep in mind. So then the question is, of course, how do you build a simulator uh, that can provide you the right answers, right? Unfortunately, I don't have a very good recipe for that. <laughs> I think I've built a lot of simulators in my life. My PhD thesis, for example, I built it on five different simulators. And all of these simulators have different kinds of benefits and upsides and downsides. I think experience helps a lot, clearly, in terms of figuring out how to simulate and how not to simulate. But I don't think we have a very good methodology of actually, right now, deciding uh, how good a simulator is. I think that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> OK, uh, so let's move to the next one. So uh, I will motivate high-level simulation. So clearly, uh, if you want to be accurate, uh, so clearly, if you don't want to fool yourself, you want to be extremely accurate. right? But extreme accuracy is not necessarily good because, as we will see, if you want to be extremely accurate, you want to be very low level, as close to real hardware as possible. Now, if you do that, first of all, the simulator takes a long time to design. So you may actually design the simulator for years and years, and your idea may become obsolete by that time. 
Does that make sense? You may not want to do that. Clearly, being extremely accurate is also not good. You really want to be just accurate enough with as little effort as possible. And that's where the art really comes in, I think. So high-level simulation has benefits. So if you really want to be very accurate, you really want to design an RTL, or Register Transfer Level Simulator, let's say Verilog or VHDL-level simulator, do it at the gate level, exactly like uh, how the processor will, be, will behave. And then someone uh, can actually build a copy of that on real hardware. Clearly, there's a step between a gate-level Verilog description or hardware description-level description, level description uh, of a processor, and then really the building of it. And that step takes a long time. So basically, you're getting rid of that as much as possible. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, uh, this is intractable for design space exploration. If you actually have done gate-level simulation before, you know how long it takes, right? Simulating a 1,000 instructions will take hours, potentially, depending on the complexity of the design, clearly. Right? And, but, but we really want to simulate billions or trillions of instructions, and even more, actually to get the long-term effects of instructions. So basically, this is too time-consuming to design and evaluate. And by the way, this is not necessarily perfectly accurate also, because remember, there's a step. You have the hardware description, very low level, but then somebody else takes it and designs a real processor. And during that step, they may change things. They may actually change timing. And usually, uh, uh, like in, in the field, people, uh, the companies that build real hardware actually have very detailed low-level, uh, hardware description-level simulators, and they don't match the hardware. So the real hardware provides a different performance uh, compared to uh, a very low-level simulator, the lowest-level simulator. Why? Because somebody changed something when they're actually really designing the hardware. So there are actually people who try to calibrate why is there this discrepan discrepancy. It's an interesting job, which, which requires a lot of patience and rigor. <laughs> it's not very easy. So if you think RTL level is uh, the, the end of everything, it's not. The real system design is the end of everything. Okay. Okay. Uh, so especially over a large number of workloads, this becomes even more intractable, and especially uh, when you have many different parameters, which we discussed, especially if you want to predict the performance of a good chunk of a workload on a particular design, right? Because you cannot really simulate for very long if you do RTL, very low-level simulation. And especially if you want to consider many design choices, many system parameters. Basically, you tweak something, you need to do the simulation. You tweak another thing, you need to do the simulation. So if you want to tweak n different parameters, and each parameter has many options, then you're in for simulating for maybe a few years. <laughs> but we don't want that. OK, I think we've already talked about some of these things. Clearly, uh, you, can, you can see that this blows up, right? This is really exponential in terms of what you want to evaluate. OK. But, but basically, our goal in high-level simulation is to explore design choices quickly. Quickly is the most important part, to see their impact on the workloads that we're designing the platform for. And whenever you're designing a platform, you're always designing for it for some workloads. Clearly, the machine learning accelerators we talked about are designed for some workloads, a very specialized set of workloads. But if you're a, a, a company that's designing general-purpose systems, like Intel, AMD, uh, a lot of the processors that they design are actually designed for general purpose workloads. Even they are designing for workloads. They have workload sets that they say, these are the workloads that are important to us. Yes, there are like thousands or ten thousands of workloads, a lot. But they're not the complete picture. You may, there, there's always a workload out there that is not inside that workload set. Okay. So clearly we have different goals in simulation also. And what we've talked about so far is we want to explore the design space quickly and see what you want to do, basically. What you want to potentially implement in the next generation platform. What you want to propose as the next big idea to advance the state of the art. That's more research, right? And the, in this case, I, I think of these as very similar, even though there might be slight differences as well. So if you're doing it in a product, production setting versus a research setting, I think in the research setting you are less bounded. But the goal in both cases is to mainly see the relative effects of the design decisions. What is the relative benefit that I get if I do X versus Y? Uh, but this is not the only goal in simulation. Uh, we briefly mentioned this goal also. We, we may want to match the behavior of an existing system. Uh, so we have, a, we have an existing system, and we want to simulate it, and we want the simulator to match the behavior of that system so that we can debug and verify it at cycle-level accuracy. You're, you have a bug in the system. In, in, in the real system, it may really be hard to understand how to fix the bug, so you can simulate the bug, right, if you have an accurate enough simulator. And you can design a fix inside that simulator, right? That's where, this is actually very, very beneficial. It could be a 
uh, it could be a logical bug, clearly. It could be a, a reliable tissue, or it could also be uh, a performance bug, right? You're expecting some performance. You're not getting that performance. Why are you not getting that performance? You simulate and you f figure out. So there's a debugging purpose also in simulation. And then you can propose small tweaks to the design that can make a difference in performance or energy or in any other metric X. Right? In this case, of course, the goal, uh, what you really want to do is a bit different. Here, the goal is very high accuracy. Right? If you really want to be able to debug a system, you cannot get away with a simulator that doesn't uh, model a lot of the details of the hardware. Right? Here, the goal is not... Uh, accuracy is less of a problem, if you will. You really want to be just accurate enough to make the right design decisions. Here, you really want to be accurate to fix the bug, potentially. Okay. So, and there are other goals in between that you can imagine. These are maybe the two extremes over here. You can, for example, try to reform, uh, refine the explore design space without going into a full detailed cycle accurate design. Maybe this is somewhere in between, right? You, you figured out, okay, these are the major design decisions I make. Now let's go into a little bit more detail in those design decisions. How am I going to make the sub-design decisions? So you figured out you do caching, uh, you do, you do prefetching over caching, let's say. You fix your cache, and then now you uh, simulate your prefetcher in a little bit more detail. Right? So there. Uh, uh, and of, also, of course, there's another thing over here. But you may want to gain confidence in your design decisions made by higher-level design space exploration. So again, uh, you don't stay at the high level. You go into lower-level simulation if you want to do that. Does that make sense? OK. And I think these goals are actually there in any kind of simulation. If you're doing climate simulation, if you're doing uh, simulation of molecular dynamics, you have similar trade-offs that you, that you want to do, actually. There, of course, the parameters are different. Uh, for example, how much time scale you simulate, or uh, at what granularity do you model the system, right? Uh, do you model the system uh, at the granularity of 100 kilometers, or do you model it at, at the granularity of one meter? Do you want to predict the weather in this square meter over here, or do you want to do it uh, uh, at, at, the, at the scale of the city itself in Zurich, right? Okay. Okay, so trade-offs, and, and these trade-offs are also very fundamental, I think. And there are three major metrics to evaluate a simulator. Uh, there's also a fourth metric, which is simulation design time, but I'm not going to talk about it over here because that's really about the design time of the simulator itself. Uh, but this is really about... Uh, what do you get out of the simulator, if you will? And the first one is what we've been talking about, speed. Next one is flexibility, and the third one is accuracy. And ideally, you want all of them, right? <laughs> you want an extremely fast simulator that's extremely flexible so that you can explore many different things. That's also extremely accurate, so you never make any mistake. And the simulator gives you exactly what the real hardware will give you if you implement an IDX. But usually, you get, if you're lucky, two out of these three. This is one of those cases where you have three goals and you don't get all of them, so you have to pick between at most two. Uh, if you get only one, I think maybe you don't have a good design. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about these. Uh, I mean, speed is obvious, but it's also good to uh, define it. This is how fast the simulator runs, gives you an output. And this could be measured in multiple ways. How many instructions per second can it simulate? The, the real system can execute, let's say, 10 billion instructions per second, the simulator may be simulating 1,000 instructions per second, which means that the simulator has some slowdown compared to a real system, right? Orders of magnitude slowdown. And if usually, usually, if you get to 100x slowdown, 100 times slowdown, it's actually very good. Of course, uh, there's a trade-off here. Or you can, you can also uh, measure this as how many cycles per second do you simulate, right? The next one is flexibility. How quickly can you modify the simulator so that you can evaluate different algorithms, different ideas, different design choices. Right? This is also very important. Uh, and accuracy, we've also talked about. How accurate are the performance or energy or metric X numbers the simulator generates versus a real design if you had built the real design? And this is also called simulation error. And this may not always be easy to understand because, you, remember, you don't have the real design. Right? You're designing for five years out there. Nobody has the real design. In a sense, you don't have the ground truth. So how do you actually ensure this accuracy? That's why, that's why this is also a part of art, right? If you want the real design, you need to actually have a method of getting the ground truth. And if you already have a method of getting the ground truth, why are you doing simulation? Okay. So this is very fundamental. And usually, as I said, it's, it's really a trade-off between these three metrics. And the relative importance of these metrics 
uh, varies depending on where you are in the design process and what your goal is. Remember, we had multiple goals in simulation. Explore the high-level design choices versus really match the simulator to an existing design. If you want to match the simulator to an existing design, your goal is really very high accuracy. You still want speed over there because you don't want to be waiting for 100 days to fix a bug, right? Flexibility may be not as much of a concern in that case, right? Because you have a real design and you want to match it. Unless your real design is extremely flexible, you're not going to care, worry about uh, making your simulator extremely flexible. But if, you, if your goal is to really uh, uh, get to uh, uh, the next big idea very quickly, I think you probably value speed and flexibility more than accuracy. This doesn't mean that you give up accuracy. This just means that you really want to get the high-level trends correct. Right? You don't care about whether an idea really improves performance by 5% or 6%. You really care about whether it improves performance right, at that point. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's, 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 it's really dependent on your goal. OK, so let's talk about this trade-off a little bit more. Uh, as we said, uh, speed and flexibility affect how quickly you can make the design trade-offs, clearly. Accuracy affects how good your design trade-off may end up being, and also how fast you can build your simulator. This is also uh, fundamental, I think. Whenever you want to make things more accurate, your simulator needs to take more time to build. And flexibility also affects how much, effect, how much human effort you need to spend modifying the simulator. And you can trade off between the three to achieve design exploration uh, and decision goals that may be different. Any questions? OK, so let's move uh, to the next one. So hopefully all of these are clear. So uh, the key idea in high-level simulation is to raise the abstraction level of modeling uh, to give up some accuracy to enable speed and flexibility. And that's exactly what you're doing uh, in, in your labs. What you're doing in your labs is really high-level simulation. You're not modeling the t exact timing of a cache, right? You're not building things at the gate level. And you're not going to do that for the rest of the course. You're really giving up some accuracy to enable fast exploration and some flexibility. And also quick simulator design, by the way. <laughs> that may not be obvious, but that's true. So the key advantage, uh, clearly this has advantages and disadvantages. You can hopefully still make the right trade-offs and do it quickly. All you need is to model the key high-level factors. You can omit the corner case conditions. So uh, uh, whenever you're doing uh, some simulation, uh, it may be good to omit some cases, really corner cases. For example, if, if you're, uh, you may not want to model page faults, let's say. Because you know that the workload is not going to get page faults, especially if it's going to be a memory resident, right? Uh, to, to get the first order design right. And then what do you do? But the, doing only that is not good enough. Whenever you're designing a simulator, you should really add counters or something to record how many times something that you didn't model is actually happening. Right? And then you look at those counters. And then you figure out, OK, I didn't model this factor x, let's say page faults, but I see a lot of page faults that should be happening. And then you say, OK, maybe I should go and model the page faults, right? if you figure that out. That's good simulator design. You make a trade-off, you don't model something, but you keep a record of it. And whenever the workload is executing, it'll increment the counters every time this thing that you didn't model happens. And then you go back and check. That's the idea. And, that's a very, uh, and if, if, if it never happens, then you made the right des design decision, right? Of course, that check should be correct as well, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, and also, all you need in this case is to get the relative trends accurately, not exact performance numbers. But of course, the disadvantage is this opens up the possibility of potentially wrong decisions. That's why designing this is, uh, carefully is very important. Then the key question is, how do you ensure you get the relative trends accurately? But as I said, there is no very well-known methodology for it. A lot of it depends on experience, care, to, uh, putting in these checks, for example, uh, into your system. Uh, that's why this is a field of dreams. You may get lost in your dreams, basically, <laughs> if, if you don't make the right uh, choices over here. OK, uh, any questions? So simulation it can also be viewed as progressive refinement uh, of modeling. Basically, we start with some high-level models, and in the end, we, want, we get to the real design. And this is exactly how things operate, actually, uh, in industry, for example. If, if you want to build the next generation big processor, you start with some sort of high-level modeling. It could be analytical modeling. It could be very high-level simulation. Right? And then you make some design choices, refine them, and you build some medium-level, less abstract models that go into a little bit more detail, 
because you fixed some of the design decisions over there. Right? This could be, for example, do I build an out-of-order machine or do I build a data flow machine? Right? These two are designed differently, potentially, because out-of-order is restricted data flow, as we discussed last time. Do I build an in-memory uh, processing engine or do I build a traditional architecture that's processor-centric? Right? That's very high level. And then once you make some design decisions, you build medium-level models that are more accurate. Uh, hopefully you don't do it for every single model up there. Right? Uh, and then you build lower-level models. RTL with everything modeled, for example, is probably the lowest level you can get close to the real design. But as I said, there's still a gap between the real design here. And then you eventually refine your choices and build the real design. That's usually the, uh, how, how, how things progress when you're actually building hardware. As you refine, as you go down the above list, uh, normally, well, clearly, ex abstraction level reduces. Here, you're very abstract. Here, you're very gate level. You can identify the gates, timing, signals. Accuracy hopefully increases, but this is not necessary, actually, if you're not careful, especially. Ideally, once you build a... Um, uh, model that's much lower level, your accuracy should reduce, but that's not necessarily true. And this is, I've seen this in experience in real companies. Sometimes higher level models are more accurate because uh, even here, for example, at the medium level, low level models, you're not modeling everything. Right? And once you're not modeling everything, if you're missing something, that may have an effect on the performance that's much more significant than what you're missing over here. Here, actually, you may, at, the, at the abstract level, you can capture some parameters much better. For example, uh, energy is a very hairy thing to actually simulate. What is the energy that's consumed by this processor? And you may build a very, very sophisticated model uh, that basically takes the energy that's consumed by every single operation that you model, multiplies it with the energy of that operation. Right? And then in the end, you, you have a count at the end of the simulation. How many times did this operation happen? And you know how much energy this operation consumes. And you have a summation of uh, the energy per operation times the number of times the operation happened in the processor. That's an energy model. Actually, a lot of energy models work that way. You can actually so extend your cache model that you build with an energy model that way. And that's a relatively detailed energy model. But that may not be accurate, as, as accurate as modeling energy at a high level. So let me give you a high-level model of the energy. I don't look at every single operation mapping. Operation, in this case, is some cache accesses, uh, cache read, cache write, register file read, register file write, instruction fetch, instruction decode. Imagine everything that's going on in the processor. You figure out uh, these very small operations, and then you have an energy cost for each. At the high level, I may actually build an instruction level model. Right? I don't do this very low-level modeling. I basically say each instruction I'm going to associate with some energy value. I'm going to count the number of instructions that are executed. And, and add consumes energy x. And multiply consumes energy y. Uh, divide consumes energy z, dot, dot, dot. I'm going to count how many instructions uh, is executed for each instruction type. And multiply it with the energy consumed per that instruction. That model actually may be more accurate compared to the very, very low level energy model that you have. Because very low level energy model may be missing some signals, potentially. And I've seen this, actually. Uh, they're, they're actually really interesting results that people have reported. Uh, you may actually uh, make the wrong decisions with your energy models if you forget to model something at the very low levels. OK. But hopefully, this increases. <laughs> uh, flexibility reduces, actually, clearly reduces as you go from high-level models to uh, real design over here. Your real design is not as flexible as your high-level models. Uh, and speed also likely reduces. And if it doesn't reduce, you're doing probably something wrong. If, if this, is not as, uh, this is not much faster than these low-level models, that there's something wrong uh, with your design. But of course, real design, the speed is much faster, right? <laughs> Once you have the real design, because it's really not modeling, it's really executing the workload, that should be much faster. But that's not simulation anymore. OK. That's a good point for a joke. Some people argue that real designs are simulations also, right? in real life, for example. But that's a different thing. <laughs> OK. Uh, and, and the other benefit that you get if you built all of these models, actually, is you can loop back and fix your higher level models. Once you have this full uh, progressive refinement uh, structure, you really have high level models, medium level models, low level models, and your real design. 
Now you can go back and fix any of your models and tweak it slightly so that it's more accurate. Yes? So since we serve these credible models and we don't obviously have access to them using the lower voice, what do we use to study other like subjects that we don't have? Yeah, basically you go uh, and refine the design decisions that you make. For example, if you, uh, if you have a high-level model of caching versus prefetching, I'll continue with that. You go and really uh, make your uh, prefetcher a little bit more uh, a better modeled. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So progressively, you get closer to the real hardware. <laughs> and then once you have the real design, you have the real numbers. Now you can go back uh, and uh, fix. Uh, but this is what happens ex exactly in companies that produce hardware also. For example, Intel has many high-level models. For uh, w Whenever they des design their system, they start with a high-level model, and then they progressively refine it, they get the real design. Now they have the luxury of fixing their models, and they improve their models over decades and decades, right? That's the benefit of being uh, uh, doing this for a long time. And as I said, uh, people try to... Uh, improve this as much as possible, right? Uh, people try to actually make this low-level models as accurate as possible to the real design uh, so that they can fix the bugs as much as possible. And simulation is actually very important uh, because if you don't have a good simulator, you, you may not make any design decision, right? I, I've experienced this actually. There, there was a big project at a big company uh, and this was a flagship product. And uh, for, for a long time, they really didn't have a good simulator. And then they had to hire some people who would design really good simulators, and those people really saved that product, I would say. The product in the end was extremely successful, but uh, they, they really had to hire the people uh, to do the simulation correctly. And also, uh, I, should, I should talk about flexibility. Uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting design decisions that you make, because some, simulation is inherently very parallel, right? You can, you can, uh, there's a lot going on in the machine, uh, you can build a high-level model that's multi-threaded, for example. Or you can build it single-threaded. Now, if your multi-threaded model is not easy to modify, then you get into a lot of issues also. And I've seen that also in real life. People build these multi-threaded, very complicated simulators. And then somebody goes and modifies the simulator so that they can implement their idea. But they forget a lock. Forget to take a lock because this is multi-threading, multi right? And once you do that, you may actually get a wrong result also, right? If your simulator breaks, that's good, because you figure out that there's something wrong with the code. But if your simulator doesn't break, and because you didn't take a lock, some part of your simulator is progressing fast, and the simulator gives you a very high number in terms of performance, then you may actually be fooling yourself. Right? So simulator design actually affects the flexibility as well as accuracy at the same time. Do you do multi-threaded versus single-threaded? So readability of code is really, really important, especially if you're working in uh, relatively big design teams. Okay. So let's move to the next one. So making the best of architecture. I think an architect really is comfortable at all levels of refinement, including the real design. It's really good to go through the full loop uh, from the very beginning uh, to down to the real design. That's what I meant, including the extremes. And it's also good to know when to use what type of simulation. Right? If you want to really make big design decisions, you don't start with extremely accurate simulators. If you start with them, you'll never get to the big design decisions. Or you may be missing some big design decision, right? You really start with very high-level models, but you, you need to be careful in terms of what you model. And well, more generally, what type of evaluation method, right? If you can do this with an analytical model, you should do it with an analytical model. Uh, and I think I've already listed the uh, evaluation methods that are available over here. OK. Any questions? Yes? No? Fun? Okay. In this course, you're going to see uh, some simulators. You're working on one simulator right now, but th there will be other simulators. So let me talk about an example simulator and the kind of studies that it enables uh, you to do. These are just examples. But clearly, you've seen a lot of other examples, right? In processing in memory, everything I described is really done in simulation. So all of those ideas are explored with simulation. Uh, and other people later validate the simulator also. That's another way of validating simulator, especially in research. If you open source your simulator, people take it, and people really find the bugs and improve things, and they actually validate as well as fix the simulator. This is an example simulator. Uh, this is a simulator that we uh, released in 2015. Uh, we called it RAMlator. It's really the DRAM simulator. 
Actually, there's a story. It's not, it was, even though it was released in 2015, uh, it really started in 2006 or so when I uh, started the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research. I wanted to explore uh, memory systems, and basically we wrote a simulator uh, with my collaborator, Thomas Mashubroda, uh, who's an ETH alumnus, by the way. Uh, we, we wrote the simulator uh, that's in C-sharp, Microsoft, right? <laughs> I liked C simulators, but C-sharp is also okay. Uh, it was slow because it was C-sharp, uh, and uh, we modeled uh, the memory system, and then I, I took that simulator, that I, I fed it into my research group when I joined Carnegie Mellon, and they, my students improved the simulator a lot. And at some point, we decided to release that version of the, or incarnation of the simulator in 2015, which is very different from the simulator that we started writing in 2006. So the simulator has a long history. Uh, it's a relatively accurate simulator, as you will see, and it's, it's used by both academia and industry very heavily. In, in fact, industry actually uh, uses the simulator, uh, this simulator because uh, there's no other simulator that provides the same kind of behavior. And they actually have sent us bug fixes so that we can actually improve the uh, simulator. But let me give you what the simulator is about. The simulator is essentially uh, about modeling DRAM and memory controllers, and you're going to use, hopefully, the simulator in a later lab. Uh, and the, our motivation at the time for, for releasing the simulator, uh, not necessarily just starting the simulator, but releasing the simulator, was to enable people to really evaluate all of these different types of DRAM designs and memory controller designs. Uh, today we have, clearly as you've seen, DRAM and memory control landscape is changing. There are many new and upcoming standards, and there are many new controller designs, and a fast and easy to extend simulator is very much needed to understand which of these standards and which of the memory controller designs uh, are better than others, or what kind of benefits and downsides do they provide in terms of performance, efficiency, whatever metric you're interested in. And you can see that uh, this was this is actually a copy and paste from uh, one of the tables in the uh, paper. Uh, it shows at that time uh, there are different technologies. Today we have even more technologies coming up. Okay. So what does Remulator do? It basically provides out-of-the-box support for many DRAM standards. You can model all of these different DRAM standards, and we will see one of the benefits of why uh, this is good soon. Uh, and also, you can model anything you want in, on top of it, like academic proposals. Some of them uh, you will actually see. Row clone, you remember, right? Ambit, I don't think it supports Ambit in this incarnation, but Ambit was built uh, on uh, partly Remulator. Uh, and it's fast. You can see that it's... Uh, according to these results, it's relatively fast compared to the fastest op open source simulator. And you can see that this uh, table provides some numbers. Some of these are other simulators that were, that were available at that time. Uh, you can see the uh, runtime of the simulator over here in micro benchmarks that are doing random accesses and streaming accesses. And you can see that streaming accesses are actually, it actually take shorter to simulate. That's fundamental because streaming accesses are, take shorter in real life and they take shorter to simulate also. And you can see this is another measure of performance. How many requests per second do you, does it take? This is the memory consumed by the simulator. That's also an important metric, right? This, this, deter, this determines whether you can run the simulator in all of the platforms. Now, in this case, uh, the, the evaluation sets are relatively small. That's why the memory consumed is relatively small, etc. You can, you can take a look at these numbers. Uh, but the key, one of the key characteristics of the simulator is modular and extensible to different standards. So you can model everything in the same substrate. And this is one of the studies that you can do. I'll go into a little bit more detail on a more uh, real study. So basically, you can compare all of these different standards over here. DDR3, DDR4, self, sub level parallelism was our proposal. We will discuss it when we talk about latency. Low power DRAM, graphics DRAM, high bandwidth memory. Actually, all of these, uh, except for self, empl are employed in real systems, except for wide IO and wide IO2. Uh, well, wide IO and wide IO2 are also employed, actually, but uh, some of these are employed a lot more. I think this one still has a DDR3, but this one is LPDDR, for example. Uh, but basically, you can see that these different DRAM standards have different characteristics. Then the key question is, which one, uh, uh, how much uh, does each of, the, each of them affect performance? So with Remulator, you can do that study, basically. You can build a graph that looks like this. Uh, on the x-axis, you see different standards. On the y-axis, this is the IPC, or instruction per cycle distribution, when you run 22 spec workloads uh, in single-threaded mode with a simple CPU model. And this is normalized to DDR3, which is set somewhere, but not here. Ah, normalized to DDR3, there you go. It's a good figure. <laughs> when you look at a figure, you should really know 
what it's about. In this, this case, you, you know that what it's normalized to, right? If this figure didn't have information about what it's normalized to, then I wouldn't be able to figure it out, right? Because that's, that thing that is normalized is not here, DDR3. Okay, but you can basically make, conclu uh, make conclusions like DDR4 is higher performance over here on average. Uh, LPDDR4 is actually lower performance on average. High bandwidth memory is actually much higher performance. Uh, you can see that the distribution also is like this, with a simple model. Does that make sense? This is, this is exactly what you want to do whenever you, you want to design your next generation memory system, for example. Okay. And you're going to see the simulator. I'll give you an optional assignment if you really want to do it. I mean, you're going to have to do it for your, one of your labs later on, but basically, uh, feel free to review this simulator paper and download and run it. It's, it should be very easy. And this, this really helps people to get started with memory system research very quickly. So there's another benefit of releasing this sort of simulators because it reduces the barrier to entry in, into a research area. Because once you, start, once you want to start memory systems research and you have a great idea, the first thing that you, uh, once you, uh, after you develop your great idea, the first thing that you're, you're faced with is, how am I going to evaluate this idea? Right? And if you don't have something that's out there that enables you to evaluate it fast, it's very difficult to build it on your own. Okay, so let's, let me give you an example study using Remulator, and this will be uh, something that will motivate uh, what comes next in the next part of the lecture, which is about memory latency. Uh, so this is a study that was recently published in Sigmetrics, uh, and we called it Dem Demystifying Workload and DRAM Interaction in Experimental Study. And we wanted to answer the question of what type of DRAM should you be using for what type of workload? And it turns out that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, one of the reasons why it's not easy is you cannot do this experiment in a real system. Why? Let's assume that you know what kind of processor you're going to use. That's the assumption we have over here. We fix the processor. What kind of memory should we use for what kind of workload? Now, you have n different memory types out there. I think we evaluate nine over here. And you have a gazillion of workloads. Let's assume we pick some of them. Uh, you want to do this experiment on a real system, but there's no real system that gives you support for different memory types. So this thing, you cannot modify the memory in it. It, can, it. it has a memory control for LPDDR3, and that's it. You cannot run your same workload on this system and swap out LPDDR3 and put high bandwidth memory, for example. Good luck with that. You're not going to be able to do that. As far as I know, there's no system, actually, that gives you support for more than one type of memory. There may be some FPGA systems that have support for two types of memory, let's say HBM and DDR3, but they're relatively new, actually. But that's only two. And you want to make a decision for nine different memory systems, right? This is actually interesting because this ties to the story uh, related to review system and kind of how broken it is a little bit sometimes. But basically, we submitted this paper to a major conference, top, top conference actually, ISCA, International Symposium on Computer Architecture. Uh, one of the comments we got uh, from a person who rejected the paper, and that was the main reason for rejection, is you should have done the study on a real system. <laughs> now, it's... Uh, kind of odd because there's no way you can do the study on a real system. And if you really want to build a real system to do this study, good luck with it. We will later talk about the complexity of memory control. And if you really want to design a memory controller for nine different memory types, it'll, it's going to take a long time. Okay, so let me give you uh, what we have done. Basically, uh, our motivation was uh, clearly manufacturers are already developing many new types of DRAM. And DRAM is important, as you know, uh, for performance and energy. And new types may overcome some, some of the limitations. And memory systems also are serving a, new, a, a set of very diverse set of applications today. So you can no longer take a one-size-fits-all approach in the memory system. So the key question is, which DRAM type works with, best with which application? And it's very difficult to understand intuitively due to the complexity of the interaction. If you read the paper, you will see that it analyzes a lot of different metrics. And this cannot be tested methodically on real system because new type needs a new CPU, uh, actually a new memory controller. Uh, and in this work, uh, uh, there, it's, a, it's an experimental study to uncover the combined behavior of workloads and DRAM types. It turns out we examined 115 different applications. We could always examine more. I believe there are more applications to be examined over here. And nine modern DRAM types. So let's take a look at these DRAM types a little bit. And we're going to talk about low latency memory. So the, uh, they, they differ. These are some of the major parameters that they, they differ in. But of course, they differ in some of the minor parameters as well, the tables uh, in the paper. DDR3 is used in many systems. People are transitioning to DDR4. Uh, DDR5 is graphics, so it has very high bandwidth, uh, but it's similar to DDR3 and uh, DDR4 because uh, of the basic architecture. 
So if you look at uh, when you move from DDR3 to DDR4 or DDR5, you actually increase the number of banks. But because you cannot have so many banks on the memory channel, what uh, the memory manufacturers have done is group those banks. So if you're accessing uh, banks in this group, everything is good. But if you want to switch to another group, you pay some latency penalty. So you need to model that, for example, in the simulator to get a good understanding of uh, what performance benefits or loss you would get by going from DDR3 to DDR4. So they, you get higher bandwidth, but you get increased latency and increased area and power. So there are other trade-offs, like high bandwidth memory, which is used in pretty much all GPUs today, and also FPGAs. It's stacked, and it has some number of banks. Did I do this? OK, I, I guess I did it. Uh, and uh, you can see you can model 3D stacked DRAM like this and the characteristics of it. You can model this dedicated logic layer. Hybrid memory cube is also similar uh, to this, but I'm not going to talk about that. But you can see that uh, the trade-off this makes is it increases the number of banks significantly, but it reduces the row size, and it increases the latency at the same time. So it's a complex interaction again, right? Do you increase the number of banks so that you can access memory in mo more in parallel? Uh, while you're doing that, do you really want to reduce the number of rows uh, or, or, or the size of your rows, which means that you get less spatial locality exploitation, and you also get higher latency? Okay, now you can keep increasing this, and you can see that uh, these all have a different design space. So it's very hard to intuitively figure out what DRAM type would benefit your application. So you can do the studies like this. This is exactly what we did. Uh, this is one of the results, and hopefully this will be motivating the next part of the lecture. Uh, it turns out some of these new DRAM types increase access latency to provide more banks and higher throughput at the same time. And it turns out if you have single-threaded applications, uh, many, many of those applications can't make up for the increased latency unless you go and rewrite your application somehow uh, so that you exploit those more banks. And we found out that this is especially true for some of the common OS routines like process forking, file I.O. They're relatively limited by the latency, how fast you can do this. Right, as opposed to the higher throughput that you get. That's, so that's one of the findings of the study. Uh, GDDR5 is interesting. This is graphics memory. It actually improves bandwidth as well as reduces latency. As a result, you can see that it, it, behave, it improves performance on these single thread applications uh, compared to others. But if you look over here, for example, hybrid memory cube, even though it's 3D stacked, high bandwidth memory, even though it's 3D stacked, it actually reduces performance in some of these applications relatively significantly. Uh, because it increased the latency. OK. OK, one of the takeaways is basically several applications don't benefit from more parallelism. They're actually more bound by latency. So these are some of the key takeaways from the study. Uh, so this is the benefit of doing high-level simulation, as you can see. You can make these high-level conclusions. DRAM latency remains a critical bottleneck for many applications, and we're going to try to solve that problem. Bank parallelism is actually not fully utilized by a wide variety of the applications. And part of the reason is the application is not written for that purpose. So if you really want to exploit parallelism, you may want to rewrite your application to, for your memory type. Uh, the third one is spatial locality is important if it is exploited by the memory subsystem. So it's important. You can, you can gain a lot of benefit from spatial locality, but the memory system should really exploit it. And applications should also exploit it, of course. And it turns out, uh, in, in some of the ap uh, applications, some of the classes, low-power memory can provide significant energy savings without uh, a lot of loss in performance. So I think going forward, this is going to be very important also. Like, how do we actually... Uh, Low-power memory actually reduces the power of memory by changing the interface significantly. The trade-off is it increases the latency in some cases, and its bandwidth is, could be lower also. But some class of applications can actually overcome that latency increase, especially if, you can exploit the, if they exploit the parallels. So this is important going forward, I think. Okay. So I think I already talked about this. this uh, so this is actually already released as part of the Ramulator release. You can actually do these studies on your own. Uh, even the workloads are released. Some of them uh, are too large to be put on GitHub, but most of the workloads are released. This could be an interesting study to do, perhaps, for a lab. <laughs> OK, uh, I'm going to skip this. This is looking at these observations. Sorry, there, there are more observations over here, but uh, I think we're going to cover uh, some of these later on. So uh, you can also, uh, as we've discussed, uh, with simulation, you can, you can implement whatever you dream of. And we've recently released Ramulator for processing in memory. You can all, do all of those processing in memory experiments by extending the simulator. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. You can read this paper 
that doesn't describe the simulator, that describes what you can, one of the things that you can potentially do with the simulator, but you can download the source code and run it and figure out what you want to do with the simulator also. Basically, you can enable your own dreams or evaluate your own dreams. Okay, so that's all I want to say about simulation. Any questions? Thoughts? No? Everything I said is good? Are people enjoying building the simulator for the labs? Enjoying is a strong word. <laughs> there, there are a lot more complex simulators in the world. <laughs> That's also important. I think I like building my own simulators, and I built a lot uh, over my career. And I like thinking simple when I design a simulator. But, and I don't enjoy really working with simulators that are extremely complex, hard to read. But they also exist, and they, they also had impact as well. And I've, had, I've, had, I've, I've actually had to implement my PhD thesis on one of those simulators, and it was so painful. In the end, it was good. But uh, if you have extremely detailed... Uh, I, I've implemented P, my PhD thesis actually on... Uh, not all levels of the refinement, uh, that progressive refinement, but at least three of those levels, a very detailed RTL simulator, a very high-level uh, exploration simulator, and uh, the medium-level medium simulators. And once you implement the same idea on all of those different refinement levels, you, will, you exactly see the trade-offs very well. It's so much nicer at the higher levels. <laughs> but as you go down, uh, uh, to, make it, uh, to, to make an idea work, you may actually need to add more detail. So it's actually good uh, to go down after you make the design decision. You don't want to stay up there. If you really want to make an idea work, you need to go down the next level in simulation also to figure out what are the details that you need to take into account. Uh, for example, do you really want to model the TLB? And once the TLB is there, how do you handle that? Right. At the very high level, you may not want to talk about the TLB or page faults as I discussed, right? If your workload is not page fault bound. And once you go into even more detail, once you start placing the gates, how do I actually close the timing uh, becomes an issue, especially if your idea is, uh, uh, affects the timing on a critical path. So there, there are different levels of issues that you need to solve as you move down the levels of refinement uh, that I showed you earlier. And if you really want to get an idea to work, you really want to go down all the, all the way. Sometimes it's better if someone else does the, uh, does the going down in the next step for you. But if, as an architect, you may need to work with that someone else to make sure that uh, your, your idea is actually implemented correctly. Okay, so this is a good time to take a break, I think. Uh, so let's take a 15-minute break. Let's be back at 13.35. And then we'll start with low-latency memory. And hopefully I've given you some motivation for low-latency memory now. <laughs>